Hey friends, welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. It's a pleasure to have your company. Abby will be reading to us tonight, and you may remember that since the summer, we've been traveling along with a lady called Emma as she visits lighthouses on the coast of Maine. Now, as we wrap up the festive season and look ahead to the new year, Emma's travels will culminate in a stop at one of Maine's most celebrated historic beacons. Not only does this lighthouse boast many interesting stories, but it's famous for being decorated with beautiful lights for the season. Okay, it's time for us to settle in and transition away from the day, enjoying the calming atmosphere of this peaceful night. For some people, this transition may feel easy and swift, but for others, it can take a little more time. Either way, it's okay. I certainly find that I need to be patient with my body and mind when I get into bed at night. It can take a fair old while before I'm feeling ready to fall asleep, even when I'm quite tired already. What's important is that we go easy on ourselves and avoid a sense of frustration from building within. Frustration will only make it more difficult to relax and rest. So, let's help ourselves find that calming spot to rest in. Close your eyes if you haven't already. and take a deep breath in now, drawing in a sense of serenity. And as you exhale back out, let your shoulders relax, unclench your jaw if you're holding any tension there, and just feel your body ease further into the comfort of your bed with each release of the breath. As you listen along to our story, maintain a calm and steady rhythm with your breathing. Bit by bit, you'll gently ease closer to sleep. Now, Picture a single light shining in the darkness. A foghorn sings its melancholy song, and the lapping of the waves drifts over you. The noises of the day have subsided, and it's evening on the snowy coast. This is where our story begins. It was that part of the year between Christmas and New Year when Emma always felt like time was standing still. With the whirlwind of the holiday behind her and the dawning of the next year just ahead, it always seemed like she was poised between two worlds. On one hand, she was loath to let go of all the gatherings and festivities of December. On the other, She was feeling the desire to look ahead and return to some type of routine. 
For this moment, suspended between the two holidays, she didn't ever quite know what to do with herself. Appropriately, in keeping with that feeling of being in between, Emma was travelling home after spending the holiday with a friend in the upper reaches of Maine. All year, she'd been making trips up and down the coast as she completed research for her book about the region's storied lighthouses. Since she was passing by the southern Maine town of York, she had decided to treat herself to a room at a luxurious coastal hotel in the vicinity of the famously beautiful Cape Neddick Light. As Maine's southernmost beacon, it was an appropriate last stop on her way home. Normally, Emma stayed in more modest accommodations, but this very stylish hotel on the cliffs had offered a last-minute low rate for the week after Christmas. Feeling both decadent and opportunistic, Emma had taken the opportunity to spend a night in the lap of luxury. After hours of winding her way down the coastal route from the north, she gladly rolled into the spacious parking lot of her hotel and stopped the car. Leaning over the steering wheel, she peered beyond the sleek silhouette of the building and got a glimpse of a glorious pastel sunset taking place over the water. The wintry palette of white and grey that dominated the landscape made the colours in the sky all the more incredible. As chilly and brilliant as sorbet, they spread in wide layers of pink and tangerine disappearing into the salt water below, bracing herself for the icy chill, she pushed her way out of the car and retrieved her rolling suitcase from the trunk. The crisp December air pricked her eyes and nose as she strode towards the front door of the building. She was relieved when the glass door silently glided open, releasing a welcoming gust of warmth from inside the lobby. She had arrived. The reception area itself was worth the trip. Overstuffed chairs and couches were arranged around a crackling hearth to one side. Straight ahead, an enormous picture window offered a breathtaking view of the sea and the sunset outside, which was now deepening to twilight. Emma had to tear herself away from the sight of the window in order to approach the front desk, where a helpful attendant patiently awaited her. She sensed from the desk attendant's smile that her reaction to the view was a common one. The woman waiting to check her in was a kindly person who appeared to be in her sixties. Smartly attired in a white blouse and navy blue pants, she welcomed Emma to the hotel while she set up her keycard. She said her name was Helen and offered her assistance with any local information or hotel services Emma might need. Having said that, she pointed the way to the elevators that would take Emma to her room, which overlooked the ocean. Swiping her keycard in the lock, Emma opened the door to a luxurious hideaway and a stunning view. The furnishings were understated, 
with a contemporary feel and neutral colours. The king-size bed looked very inviting, dressed impeccably in crisp white linens and a cosy-looking comforter. Standing her rolling suitcase to the side, Emma walked to the window and pushed the curtains a little wider apart. The last of the sunset was quickly disappearing and she hoped she'd soon be seeing the moon over the seething waves of the ocean below. She couldn't believe her good luck getting a room like this for a whole night. In fact, seeing how comfortable her room was she realised she didn't feel like leaving again that evening. In a moment of self-indulgence, she turned and picked up the room service menu. She would order dinner in. Meanwhile, she could review her notes and refresh her memory about the history of the Cape Nedic Lighthouse. After all, she'd be seeing it tomorrow. She was planning to head to the lighthouse in the late afternoon so she could see its famous holiday lights when darkness fell. She had seen photographs of this iconic display and knew that the entire structure would be illuminated. It was sure to be memorable. She felt rather lucky that she happened to be visiting at this time of year. Looking forward to her cosy evening, she picked up the phone and ordered herself a toasted cheese sandwich and a bottle of mineral water. Then she unpacked her cosy flannel pyjamas and some fuzzy socks. By the time her dinner arrived at the door, she was ready to relax, wrapped in the thick, white, complimentary robe that came with the room. When the room service delivery arrived, Emma placed her tray conveniently nearby on an end table. Then she leaned back in the armchair by the window sinking into its luxurious softness. While her computer started up, she pulled out a free tourism circular she had grabbed on a magazine rack some time ago. It contained pages with short informational descriptions of each of Maine's lighthouses. Flipping past many dog-eared pages, she folded the pamphlet open on the page for Cape Nedic Light and settled in to remind herself of the basic facts about the structure. The lighthouse had been established much later than some she had visited, in 1879. Apparently, sailors had been requesting a lighthouse for nearly 70 years before the money was finally appropriated by President Rutherford B. Hayes. The 41-foot tower was not as tall as that of some others, such as the Portland headlight. However, the position of the lighthouse on a promontory, gave it a total height of 88 feet above sea level, making the light very visible. The cast iron tower for the beacon had originally been a chocolate brown colour, but it had been painted white in 1902 and stayed that way ever since. The light tower was attached by a walkway 
by an attractive six-room keeper's house that was big enough to host a family. As such, Cape Nedick had developed the character of a family-occupied lighthouse over the years. It made for some charming stories. The historical accounts had been a more fanciful read than the stories of some of the more isolated light stations. When she was first researching Cape Nedick, Emma had sometimes been thrown by the fact that it was very commonly referred to as Nubble Light. This was because of its location on the aforementioned promontory, which was known locally as the Nubble. The name seemed altogether too whimsical for such a stately landmark, but Emma was finding in her reading that it was appropriate. Unlike more distant and austere beacons she had researched and visited, Nubble Light was near enough to local towns that people treated it like a neighbour. The lighthouse was not open for tours, so Emma would have to view it just like everyone else did. From nearby Sawyer Park, Although the nubble was not accessible to the public, it felt almost near enough to touch. She had read that in a very low tide, keepers had been known to occasionally walk to or from the island on the slippery rocks. For the most part, however, Boats had always been used to ferry people and goods to and from the light station. Still, it was close enough to the mainland that a cable and pulley had also been strung across for a time, so that keepers could transport supplies by ferrying a basket to and fro. In this way, Cape Nedick Lighthouse had paradoxically been both unapproachable and familiar, both distant and cheek by jowl with the town of York, Maine. Emma dropped her pamphlet on the table and thoughtfully applied her energy to eating her dinner. She turned over her plans for the next day in her mind. Sleeping late was definitely on the agenda. Helen at the desk had told her, in fact, that she could have a late checkout at noon if she wished. Even so, she would probably delay her departure further and settle in by the fire in the lounge after that. One of the most fantastic aspects of the Cape Nedick Lighthouse was that it was gorgeously decorated with white lights during December. She had heard that these would illuminate at twilight. If she timed her plans right, she thought she could spend a little time viewing the lighthouse from the park at sunset, and then be there when the lights went on at dusk. It was sure to be a lighthouse view like no other. Setting her empty tray in the hall, Emma sat down on her enormous bed and pulled the laptop over, propping herself up with a generous stack of pillows. 
clicking through the informational links she had saved earlier, she searched for a particularly fascinating bit of information she'd found a few days ago. Incredibly, an image of the Cape Nedic lighthouse had been part of the Voyager Golden Record, which was an audio-visual disc sent into space on the Voyager 2 spacecraft in 1977. The disc was meant to communicate facts about Earth, should it ever encounter intelligent life. As part of that record, the scientists who created it showed digitized photos of different types of landscapes found on our planet. Providing an iconic example of a seascape, a photo of Cape Nedic Light and its surroundings were included. Emma found that idea absolutely incredible. Nubble Light and its setting were so classic in appearance that they had been chosen to represent an entire type of landscape. Voyager 2 was now estimated to be more than 12 billion miles away carrying that image of Cape Nedic and its rugged oceanside home to other solar systems. It was hard for her to conceptualize. All these ruminations on the vastness of the universe and the legacy of humanity were beginning to make Emma feel awfully drowsy. Sooner than she expected, she found herself wanting to simply close the laptop and go to bed. Cocooned in her luxurious room, with the waves crashing distantly in the darkness outside, it didn't really matter to her what time it was. As she had hoped, The moon had risen over the water. It seemed to gaze benevolently down at her, giving her permission. She was ready for sleep. It wasn't long before Emma had put away all her Cape Nedic research for tomorrow, brushed her teeth, and settled into her spacious, pillowy bed. Emma dreamed of the endlessly swirling waters of the ocean that night. It was many hours before she woke to a thin crack of light pushing its way between the heavy blackout curtains she had pulled closed the night before. Giving herself a moment to acclimate, she rolled over and stared at the sliver of light that ran across the carpet. She felt properly refreshed and ready to meet the nubble light today. Sitting up in bed, she pulled the downy comforter off and swung her feet to the floor. Looking at her phone next to the bed, she was amazed to see it was almost ten o'clock. She had slept for more than twelve hours without waking. Stretching happily, She picked up the room service menu again. A toasted bagel and a cup of coffee sounded like just the thing for breakfast. She placed the order and then went about getting ready for the day. 
Delightfully, this day included mostly relaxation. By the time her bagel arrived, she was looking over her notes about Kate Neddick. More than some distantly located lighthouses, this one had always attracted a large number of tourists. The current statistics showed that some half million people visited each year. This was despite the fact that the lighthouse itself was not even accessible to visitors. Still, the outstanding view from the nearby park was sufficient to keep the tourists coming. In fact, it seemed that some hopeful visitors had actually gotten to visit the island. Many of the keepers over the years had supplemented their modest incomes by making tourism a side business. The first keeper, Nathaniel Otterson, was given a salary of $500 a year. He did not hesitate, apparently, to shore that up immediately. According to an enthusiast named Craig Anderson, who published a website called Lighthouse Friends. Proof of Otterson's tourism earnings could be found in the clippings of the Portsmouth Journal. An article from that time stated, Visitors are not allowed to visit the lighthouse at York Nubble between the hours of 6pm and 10am. But at other times, the son of the keeper will row you over and back in his boat for ten cents. The website further shared that the practice continued for many years and outlived Otterson's tenure. Apparently, the practice was still going on until Keeper Bracket Lewis was told to stop allowing visitors on Sundays in 1898. Presumably, this was because entertaining visitors was interfering with his duties. For example, he was rumoured to have sometimes forgotten to deactivate the fog bell even though it was £3,000 and could be heard six miles away. The churlish Keeper Lewis, however, claimed it was because he was making too much money. Emma took the last few bites of her bagel and smiled to herself over the tail. On her past lighthouse excursions, most of the stories she had read had been about the bravery and steadfastness of the keepers and their families. These tales of public-facing high jinks were entirely different. But she loved imagining the big personalities of these rogue tourism entrepreneurs. Sipping her coffee, she delved back into her notes, because the stories didn't end there. According to multiple sources, a keeper by the name of Brooks upped the ante when he replaced Lewis in 1904. Apparently also an opportunist, he began offering tourists bait and tackle for their visit, as well as a five-cent tour of the lighthouse given by his wife. This came to an end 
when his superiors complained of the fact that there were periodically 200 to 300 people roaming the government property, supervised only by his spouse. Keeper James Burke, who had assumed the role in 1912, seemed to be more focused on family life than on entertaining tourists. The Burks reportedly raised a cow and chickens on the island. His daughter Lucy wrote about the comforts of their home there, although she acknowledged there was no indoor bathroom. This all seemed rather idyllic to Emma. She chuckled aloud, however, reading that this wholesome period came to an end when the next keeper took over in 1919 and was soon discharged because he'd been ferrying tourists. Having taken the last sip of coffee, Emma put down her notes and stretched. She gazed out of the window at the sparkling seascape. Snow coated the ground on the rocky shore, and the water seethed and glittered in shades of dark blue and grey. Just by looking at it, She knew the weather was chilly outside. Pausing her research, she gathered her things and prepared to check out of the room. She was sad to leave her posh hideaway. But the knowledge that a crackling hearth awaited her in the lobby was a huge consolation. She pulled her suitcase out the door behind her and let the latch quietly click. Then, she silently rolled her bag to the elevator and headed down to the welcoming lobby. The elevator doors opened on a cosy scene. A cheerful fire crackled in the hearth. Except for Helen, the friendly desk attendant, there were no other people in the quiet lobby. Emma had her pick of the comfy armchairs and capacious sofas at the fireside. Parking her bag in the lounge area, Emma quietly approached the desk, as if making any noise at all would disturb the equilibrium of the room. Helen looked up with a smile. She asked Emma if she was checking out, and Emma nodded placing her keycard on the counter. Emma replied that, if it was all right, she was planning to spend a little time in the lobby before heading off to the lighthouse. Helen nodded agreeably, adding that she could certainly stay as long as she liked. Motioning to the deserted fireside seating area, she chuckled, saying, You have the run of the place. Emma returned to her luggage and chose one of the luxurious chairs to settle into. With a few hours to while away, she decided to take a break from her research and make some progress on the novel she'd been reading. 
snuggling up by the fire, turning page after delightful page, she soon lost track of the hours. Occasionally, a member of the hotel staff walked through the lobby to speak to Helen, disappearing into the hallways beyond. A couple of guests came and went. The entire place had a peaceful feeling that it was suspended above the busy activities of the world outside. It was as if the hotel was frozen in time, poised next to the crashing waves. Emma's reverie was broken only when she turned the last page of her book and closed it resolutely. Looking up, as if waking from a dream, she gazed at the seascape outside the large picture window. The sun had definitely descended in the sky. As if reading her mind, Helen asked if she might feel a little hungry. Without awaiting an answer, she further offered that it would be easy to order a bite to eat and have it brought up to the lobby. Emma realised that she was indeed interested in some late lunch. Helen walked over and handed her a paper menu from the cafe and sat down in a nearby chair while she perused it. Something simple, Emma thought. A bowl of soup. She gratefully asked Helen if some seafood chowder could be brought up. After she had called in the order, Helen took the opportunity to politely ask after Emma's plans for visiting the lighthouse. Emma volunteered that it was partly research and partly just a desire to see the famous display of the holiday light. Helen nodded approvingly. Nubble Light has always been just a little fancier than most other lighthouses, she said, winking at Emma. Did you know that the walkway railing around the light tower is decorated with little four-inch brass replicas of the lighthouse itself? Emma was surprised. This was a detail she had missed. How very odd, she responded. In her recent experience, most lighthouses were built as inexpensively as possible and upgraded only when they started to leak or tumble over. Who had paid to put little brass decorations on this one? Helen shrugged, raising her eyebrows dramatically. Nobody knows. Emma was delighted by this detail. She could never have known about it by peering at the lighthouse through the telescope in the park. Shifting around in her chair to face Helen more comfortably, she asked what other secrets Helen knew about the Cape Nedic light. Helen said that she wasn't telling Emma 
anything any local would already have known. I'm sure you've already heard about Mr. T, the cat, she added. A surprising cat story was just the type of information Emma had been digging for. She said that she had not heard about Mr. T. Clearly pleased to continue sharing intelligence, Helen went on with her tale. Mr. T had been a 20-pound ginger tomcat, which Keeper Burke brought to the island to control mice. Apparently, he was spectacular at his job, and when the Burks left, they felt he would be happiest staying with the new Keeper. In the 1930s, Keeper Eugene Coleman noticed Mr. T had started to swim to the mainland to find more mice to occupy him. His travels back and forth attracted quite a lot of attention from amused onlookers, and he became something of a local legend. He had even been written up in the paper. Upon hearing about Mr. T, Emma began to feel that this was one of the most interesting lighthouses she had ever visited. She paused her conversation with the friendly desk attendant as she saw her chowder arriving in the care of one of the cafe servers. The man set it graciously down on the end table and retreated from the lobby as silently as he had arrived. Emma inhaled the steam from the creamy bowl of chowder appreciatively and freed the oyster crackers from their plastic pouch with happy anticipation. Then, before taking her first spoonful, she pressed Helen to see if she could come up with any other stories. Other than the famous Mr. T, the best story was really the one about the basket, she added meaningfully. Emma paused her spoon halfway to the cup of chowder and cocked her head questioningly to the side. Go on, she said. Helen continued obligingly. Well, you may know that one of the ways that the keepers got supplies to and from the nubble was via a basket that hung on a cable with a pulley. Emma nodded to indicate she had already read about this. Well, in the late 1960s, A keeper by the name of David Winchester put the cable to maximum use by beginning to ferry his son across the water to school in the basket. She paused, eyebrows raised. Then she added, Naturally, the boy went over in the basket alone it would never have held otherwise. So it seems a newspaper photographer 
caught this unconventional school commute in action and took a snapshot of it. That snapshot subsequently spread all over the country in the newspapers. Emma covered her smile with her hand, feeling this was daring and funny and a bit scandalous all at once. Helen nodded with understanding. Well, the public found it to be quite a funny and interesting slice of life story about lighthouse keepers. But the Coast Guard superiors in charge of Mr. Winchester were not pleased at all. He was told to stop the practice and soon after a new policy was implemented revoking permission for school age children to live on the Nubble. Emma sat back in her chair, her bowl empty, and she reflected ruefully on what a shame it must have been. After all, between the cows and chickens, the little brass lighthouse replicas, and the marvellous swimming tabby cat, It did seem like a pretty great place to grow up. Emma turned and gazed again at the large window on the sea. The golden tint to the skies and the softening light told her that it was a good time to finally head over and see this famous lighthouse for herself. She would have just the right amount of time to take a good look before evening fell and the lights illuminated. Thanking Helen gratefully for the company, she went about gathering her things and prepared to leave her warm hideaway by the fireplace. Her stay at this lovely hotel had been such a perfect way to rest up between the holidays. Now she was ready to step out into the invigorating late afternoon and lay eyes on Cape Neddick. The drive wasn't long. Emma wound her way down the coast, with the sea on her left, and eventually came to the main street in York. Continuing on, she passed charming candy stores, shops and restaurants. As she curved around to follow the small peninsula where Soia Park was located. The water appeared on her right, periodically visible between the houses that lined the road. How lovely it must be, she thought, to have a room so close to the water. In minutes, she was pulling into the lot at the park. She was amused to see that the Lobster House restaurant to the left had a Christmas tree outside that was made entirely of lobster traps. She had heard of these fanciful lobster trap trees during her time in Maine but this was the first time she'd seen one in person. It brought a smile to her face. 
it seemed that most of the crowds must have visited before Christmas because the park was surprisingly quiet. A warmly dressed couple with a dog were wandering about and there was a small group of people collecting off to the side. They were bundled up in long coats and seemed to be a little dressed up. Emma wondered about the purpose of their visit. But the sweeping view of the lighthouse ahead of her soon demanded her full attention. The lighthouse was truly beautiful. Perched confidently atop the island, its pristine red and white outlines were cheerfully set off by the adorable red oil house that nestled below. Adding to this already charming scene, the landscape was completely frosted with snow, making the nubble look like some sort of elegant holiday pastry, dusted with confectioner's sugar. The little oil house was even decked out for the holiday, with a festive green wreath adorning the side that faced the park. Emma heard people gaily laughing from nearby, although the sound was carried partially away by the light wind. Turning, she saw the reason the small group of nicely dressed visitors must have come. A bride and groom appeared to be positioning themselves in front of the view of the setting sun. They were going to exchange vows in this seaside winter wonderland, despite the icy temperatures. The groom was dressed in a long black wool coat, and the bride had draped herself in a luxurious white cape. With a touch of humour, each had a pair of earmuffs matched to their outfit. Emma smiled to herself and admired the bride's bouquet of exotic red roses. It was a small and intrepid band of wedding goers and the officiant made sure the ceremony was brief and to the point. Emma suspected more speeches were going to be given when the wedding party moved to a cosy indoor location. Watching the happy event unfold from a short distance, she felt privileged to have been an accidental onlooker to this sweet moment. As the ceremony concluded and the light quickly disappeared from the sky, the wedding party turned to the view of the lighthouse expectantly. Emma realised they were waiting for the same thing she was here to see. Turning herself, she had only a few moments to prepare. All at once, the outline of all the buildings appeared in white, etching the Cape Nedic lighthouse against the darkening night sky. As she stood there, soaking in the beautiful glow from the island, 
she reflected on what a strange life it had led. To bring the mystique of the lighthouse life so close to the public, and yet to stand separated from them just a little bit. Cape Nedig Light had been cast in a strange role. Functional, yet dreamlike. Available and yet unreachable. As she pondered it, she remembered a poem by Emily Dickinson, which alluded to the magic of the sea for ordinary people. It said, Exaltation is the going of an inland soul to sea, past the houses, past the headlands, into deep eternity. Bred as we among the mountains, can the sailor understand the divine intoxication of the first league out from land? The first league out from land. That was where Nubble Light had always lived. In doing so, it had allowed so many people to experience the storied lighthouse life, even from hundreds of feet away. Was it any wonder the keepers had wanted to be part of that? Emma didn't think it was strange at all. They had allowed the landlocked public to live that dream for a few pennies. The wedding party had disappeared, and as she gazed thoughtfully at the white lights of the nubble, Emma noticed a few light tingles on her face. It was snowing. Stretching her arms out to the side and slowly rotating in the salty darkness, Emma closed her eyes and listened to the sound of the sea around her. Then, looking up, she imagined Voyager 2, 45 years into its journey. It was out there, carrying a photo of Cape Nedick's guiding light, farther and farther into the stars, along with an image of the Taj Mahal and music by Bach and other human artefacts. As she tried to comprehend it, in her mind's eye, the constellations and the snowflakes became one. She stood still for just one beautiful, shining moment, like a tower between the near and the far, the past and the future, the old year and the new, and she was part of Cape Nedic too.